This episode is brought to you by Kickin' It, a musical journey through the Betty Ford Center. As of 5 o'clock, you're fired. Oh, no! That's right, you read the title of the video. This review is going to be focused on ripping down our best boy, Hank Hill. Because while there are countless times where Hank is shown to be the level-headed and sensible workman messiah of the show, this is him at his most malignant and negligent. And that's admittedly a really tough argument to make, as Hank isn't anything like Homer Simpson or Peter Griffin, whom we can easily justify criticizing for their shitty behavior. Hank, though, he's a bit of a different animal. And I think that's because a lot of people really strongly identify with Hank. A lot of people relate to him and regard him as the moral North Star of the show, the one which guides all the other characters towards the truth, and which provides an example for us on how to live our best lives. Now if we could discuss the electric seat warmer? Why would we need our seat warmed? That's what pants are for. However, as any Peggy Hill fan will be able to tell you, sometimes your favorite character is also one who does terrible things, and you need to kind of learn how to square that behavior with what you like about the character. Because believe me, it is so much easier and much healthier, in fact, to live with a character's flaws and accept them for the fucked up human being they are, rather than try to justify your enjoyment of that character by ignoring their faults and pretending they're perfect and saying, actually, you don't get it, they did nothing wrong. Well, you know what? Sometimes characters do do fucked up shit, like me saying doo-doo. And you know what? <laughs> you know what? You gotta learn to say, that's okay. Yes, I like a bad character. And you know what? That doesn't say something bad about me. They're just a good character, in spite of the fucked up shit they do. And if you'll listen to my case with an open mind and be receptive to the ideas that I'm putting down, I believe that you'll see that what Hank does in this episode is much worse than anything Peggy has ever done. Yes, even the lucky GED thing, which I have to say, as messed up as that was, at least Peggy did that out of a desire to protect Luann from marrying someone almost 20 years older than her, the man's almost 40, and possibly having to slip on PP at the Costco to make a living. So while yes, Peggy did a bad thing there, you know, Lucky wasn't doing it so he could get a better job or whatever. He was literally only doing it so he could marry Luann and... If I'm Peggy and I'm looking at Lucky from an objective standpoint and thinking about all the potential that Luann has, yes, he makes her happy, supposedly, but the man's a gross-ass redneck. I kind of would uh, not want to do that either. So I at least understand where Peggy was coming from in that instance, unlike Hank in this episode. Well, she's more qualified than any other applicant, but that only goes so far. I mean, what are we going to talk about? Our feelings? Oh, and I'm just going to say right now, we are not counting Trip Larson's death against Peggy either. She did not intentionally try to kill him or anything. Trip told her to pull the lever that got him killed. You know, the whole like, pull the left lever, the left lever. She didn't know what that machine was going to do. And both Peggy and Luann were obviously horrified by his death. Uh-oh. Ah! <laughs> Trip had a mental breakdown and is now a sausage. That's not a better place. And I have actually seen a bunch of people online unironically argue that Peggy and Luann should have had a stronger reaction to this and that, oh, because they didn't, they're psychopaths, which just confuses the shit out of me. Like, there was only about 10 seconds left in that episode. What did you want to have happen? Have Peggy and Luann reduced to just a screaming mass of just unresponsive jelly? Like, what a fantastic way to end our comedy show. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fucking fact, if you people want this so bad, let Let's see what that would have looked like. Take it away, Johnny. The voices have left my head. What am I doing in a pig costume? Uh oh. <laughs> oh, how fun. You all are so right. That was so much better. I'm so glad we decided to end the episode in that way. <laughs> anyway, let's get into the nitty gritty of jerk ass Hank. I can't believe I'm getting hogtied by a dope freak. Well, of course you could have hired Maria Montalvo. The only accommodation she would have needed from you was a slobber guard. The episode begins with a scene at Strickland Propene, where the employees have gathered for a pointless team-building exercise, one that is interrupted by a very active breakfast burrito. Oh, look here. I'm sorry, folks. My breakfast burrito's fixing to say adios. 
Our employee of the month is Hank Hill. Congratulations, Hank. That's 41 times in a row. So for three and a half years, they've been doing this little song and dance purely for Hank's benefit, pretty much defaulting to him every time. It reminds me a little bit of this awkward situation I had in high school where this super smart kid named Droove had like anxiety mixed with Asperger's or something and he'd always sit at the front of the class and raise his hand extra high for every question that the teacher would ask because he wants to answer it and you know what? He got every damn question right like he was an encyclopedia which really demotivated the rest of us from participating in the class. Because kind old Droov was obviously the smartest person in the room, and because he practically would start tearing up from frustration if someone else were called upon, let alone if that person was called upon and then they got it wrong, it was almost like we stole the answer from him, because he was so obviously terrified of his participation grade slipping that he kind of felt like, oh my gosh, if I don't answer everything, then like, I'm, I'm personally accountable for how the, the, the class is doing, and it's gonna fuck everything up for me. I'm still to this day not exactly sure why that situation was allowed to go on for the entire school year, why someone didn't just take him aside and say like, listen buddy, like you've gone above and beyond anything we could have hoped for so you can like afford to chill out and just take it easy, but that's what happened from the very beginning of the school year to the very end of the school year, there he was, hand raised, super high, ready to answer any question you might have. And I told you that story because what I'm trying to get across here is that having a superstar on your team in a team setting where it's not just one person and success that's important but everybody's is both a blessing and a curse because even though Hank is clearly the eternal golden boy of Team Strickland, I always kind of had this idea in the back of my head that he would complain until he was red in the face if anyone else ever got that Employee of the Month award, even if they had shown huge improvement in their work ethic, because guess what? They were still, and will remain still, always and eternally, short of Hank's level of perfection. Like, I could totally see Hank saying something like, Oh, Joe Jack got the award, but I'm ten times better than him. This isn't fair, Mr. Strickland. Even though the award doesn't actually get Hank anything notable, and guess what? Giving it to people like Joe Jack might actually encourage them to strive for something within their reach, instead of just giving up and saying, well, like, okay, I guess Hank's gonna get it again, so why even bother trying? At least Peggy gets, like, a little trophy for her Substitute Teacher of the Year thing. What does Hank get for being Employee of the Month? A little piece of paper on the wall that says how great he is? <laughs> well, woo, pin a little ribbon on you. But since Hank has such a spotless record, Mr. Strickland decides to give his top man a little extra trust. We need to hire a new accessories associate. Well, I'll put together a short list of candidates for you. Nah, you're the quarterback at this panty raid. You make the pick. And while this may not seem like that big of a deal, Buck does make it clear what sort of reputational stakes are on the line here. Don't let me down, Hank. You do, it'll be like spitting in my face 41 times in a row. That's a uh, very vivid description there, Buck. <laughs> my goodness, I tip my saliva slickened hat to you. And his words are so potent and effective that Hank takes his new task quite seriously, even getting Bobby involved in a little bit of hypothetical interviewing. Are you married? My wife passed away two years ago. That's good, Bobby. Keep throwing me curveballs. God, that's pretty darn cute, isn't it? Like, very homey and down-to-earth. That's not something that every show could do very well, either. But because we can't soak in this tub of Southern hospitality forever, Hank then pivots to a question that is, uh, <laughs> a little surprising to hear from him. Here's one that gets at the heart of the matter. We're all Christians here. How about you? And here is where the first big issue I have with Hank comes up. His extremely troublesome hiring practices. Because even if you're a hardcore Christian, stuff like this should still set off big alarm bells in your head. Because if this shit gets to slide, then one turn deserves another and the shoe's gonna be on the other foot someday, and pretty soon entire sections of the workforce are gonna be separated by religious beliefs. That's exactly how the poor Jewish folks in the Middle Ages got a reputation for being obsessed with money because Christians considered it a big, big, big no-no for Christians to lend each other money, which is a problem because society doesn't just work without some basic lending programs. And then before you know it, bada bing, bada boom, Jews aren't allowed to do most jobs because they were considered bottom tier citizens and Christians weren't doing the lending jobs because they considered it taboo to do so. So therefore the money lending jobs mostly went to Jews because they were just like the only people who could do this big career, which then makes everyone think, oh, the Jews are in control of all the money, but no dumbass, it's because you didn't want to handle the money, which all leads us of course to Shylock in the Merchant of Venice being forced to convert to Christianity if he hoped to become a sales associate at Strickland Propane. 
You can't ask that question in an interview. It's against the law. You can't ask about age, race, religion, or sexual affiliation. Well, it's a legal equivalent of asking a woman how much she weighs. And Peggy, blessed Peggy, is totally right here. Hank cannot ask those questions. Not legally and certainly not morally. So, you know, I'm glad that we got all that cleared up before the interviews happen, because now Hank can approach them in a much more productive fashion. If you could eat at Lulee's with one of the following, would it be A. Jesus B. Muhammad C. Golda Meir Ho oh, ho ho! This is one of those things that didn't even phase me. I didn't even pay attention to or think about when I was watching the show back in the day. But God, does it get under my skin now. Ooh. And don't you dare tell me, eh, this is just Hank being written out of character, because this is the second season, folks. This is prime time. We aren't in the flanderization of the later seasons or the rough edges of the first few episodes. This is core value Hank. The one saving grace of this moment is that the show didn't linger on this point for too long and instead got us this exclusive interview with President Biden. 33 to 45 FDR was in the White House, so I was on the welfare, you know. It is so crazy how the next election cycle, one way or the other, is going to boil down to that one Millhouse quote. Dumb things never change. Hey, everybody, an old man's talking. Once Joey Jojo Shabadoo hustles out of the building and catches the next hearse out, our next interviewee is Dale, of all people, who claims that he's killed all the bugs in Arlen and needs to face new challenges, which is immediately contradicted by an ant appearing on his resume. Dale, I've known you since we were in first grade. You don't know me. I am unknowable. Talk about a sign of the times here, Dale's resume isn't being done on printer paper, but rather on lined notebook paper, a detail that really speaks to how casual Dale was in putting together his background info. But now that is three duds in a row, the fellow who wouldn't suck down lard with gold in my ear, the Crypt Keeper, and the Big D himself, Rusty Shackelford. With all of those candidates eliminated, who could possibly meet Hank's impossible standards? Mario Montalvo? My name is Maria. Oh my, <laughs> you have to understand this job requires a certain comfort level with barbecues, so I just assumed this was a typo. I have no goddamn idea why Hank seems so baffled by the thought that a woman, gasp, ugh, would want to be a sales associate. Like, he works with at least three other women, so I don't get what the big deal is here. Well, unless there's something else going on. But hey, 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 let's not jump to any wacky or whack-off conclusions. Maybe she's a big old dummy and he won't even have to consider her. You know about the king? Dual side grills, three center racks, 35,000 BTUs of propane-powered fury. As an accessories associate, it is my job to know. Ooh, never mind. She's a real go-getter, really showing off that broad knowledge. But uh, yeah, yeah, still, still, let's not forget, there's one last hurdle to get over. Ms. Montalvo, you're at the Troy Aikman Fantasy Sports Camp. It's the toughest 14 days you'll ever love, and on the bus ride home... Excuse me, who's Troy Aikman? Well, 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 looks like somebody skipped the Manger Babies review and missed out on the Helen of Aikman's last-minute cameo. <laughs> Unforgivable! With this disturbance in the propane force, Hank tells the guys what's going on, and they provide, uh, let's just say, minimally useful feedback. You gotta work with a woman nowadays, man, you gotta pull it to do like a Kathleen Willis slick Willie, man, a dang Willie, wonk, 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 wonk. He then goes to Peggy, and, rather than saying how difficult he finds it to talk to Mario Montalvo, he instead gets straight to his heterosexual point and makes this rather, like, shocking confession? Peggy, there's something I've got to tell you. I interviewed a woman today, and apparently she's very handsome. Yep, that's the real core issue here. Hank Hill, Mr. I-don't-go-for-those-sexy types, has noticed more than Ms. Montalvo's resume. He has noticed, as I have been powerless to notice as well, that Maria's voice actress has been on Deep Space Nine as a Vulcan and on Star Trek Voyager as a Bajoran turned Borg. So obviously Hank is interested in her because even just one appearance on The Trek turns you into a frothing sex god. I mean, just look at what it did for John Delancey. Woohoo! My goodness. In fact, Hank and Peggy are so titillated by this bit of workplace hotness that they even do a little bit of play acting about how the scenario might go down if Maria showed a interest in Hank. 
I don't know, Peg. What if she gets her cheek up against mine like this? Hmm. Well, in that case, you can just start to struggle politely like this. Oh, flesh and no fury. Am I supposed to be impressed? What's the matter? Getting tired for the Empire! This bit of spontaneous sex is so profoundly satisfying that Peggy didn't even take out her curlers, which is how you know Hank truly gave her a firm handshake. But while Peggy is lingering in delicious repose, Hank is left with the worst feeling imaginable post-propane clarity. This matching of scenes tells us, without directly telling us, that Hank was indeed thinking of Mario while he was within his princess's peaches, and that's why he tossed Maria aside like the belligerent Bajoran worker that she is. So yes, just to recap here, Hank will not hire you unless you're Christian, you're under 80 years old, he hasn't thought about you during sex, and as long as you're not an unhinged lunatic that's too dangerous to be around explosives. Talk about some friggin' impossible standards! Whew, why do I even try? Hank is truly history's greatest monster. Thank goodness a fresh-faced fellow has arrived to check all of his boxes. My name's Leon Petard. Hey, cowboy's all right. Leon, you just answered my first six questions. I like how the calendar there doesn't say the month, but rather the sports ball team name. Unless, of course, we've decided to rename the worst month of the year, June, to something people can actually be proud of, because right now only fish people and furries are born in June. <clears throat> also, I guess they changed to these calendars from the Strickland ones, since those girlies gave him a big ol' heart attack. Anyway, Jesse Pinkman here reads Mr. White like a book and tells him exactly what he wants to hear. But after God country and family what i love most is propane and propane paraphernalia welcome to the team this sanctifying of the propane god immediately puts Jimi hendrix into hank's good books and even goes so far as for hank to see him as something of a son a better son leon's perfect peggy he's like bobby without all that stuff bobby does He's like Bobby without all that stuff Bobby does. And if you don't understand that, well, son, maybe you're the moron. And when Hank reveals to Peggy that he passed over Maria, Peg immediately and correctly puts the pieces together and understands why her husband didn't hire her. Oh, you don't have to worry about that. I passed her over. <sighs> So you were attracted to her. What? Oh, you must think she's one hot tamale if you couldn't even stand to have her in the office. To me, this signals that Hank would have preferred to have Henry Spencer as his son and Maria as his hot new wife. Christ, Hank, you're really cobbling together your own little perfect family there, aren't you? I mean, what's next? You planning to replace your own father? My real dad could be anybody. Hey, maybe even Tom Landry. But before Hank can make Skinny Pete a brother to Chip Block, our new employee shows up several hours late to his new job, and when questioned about his whereabouts, he gives this big rambling and convoluted story that ends with a life lesson that we can all embrace. Remind you of anybody you know? <laughs> but here I am with a customer's dog, and I just can't leave her, so I promise I'll never come to work early again. So let's all address the big pink elephant in the room. George Carlin here is a drug user, but not your garden variety opioid enthusiast. The man is doing a lot of drugs at work and going through a variety of different effects. Sometimes he's stoned out of his gourd on Goofenthal, and at others he's zipping around on skooma which is admittedly a little unusual. Most drug users will seek out a particular effect, either a relaxant or a stimulant, or will sometimes mix together similar products to heighten their desired feeling. But our spunky little spice sniffer is indeed snorting, smoking, and popping whatever he can get his hands on, which is pretty wild and keeps us, the viewers, on our toes in regards to what he's about to do next. So while this behavior is more than a little atypical for drug users, it keeps things non-specific enough for the show to hit on all the big drug symptoms and show us a wider variety of behaviors. Via con Dios. Uh, okay then. <laughs> Better yet, his surreal symptoms are beautifully balanced out by Hank's dry and unresponsive reactions. Hey, it's the Char King.
And because Kurt Cobain's performance reflects on Hank's hiring skills, Mr. Hill is incentivized to ignore those red flags and just shrug off the issues as a new hire jitters. Well, I could have sworn I saw him over by the trucks puking his guts out. Well, he's pretty excited about working in propane, sir. Uh, but once he sells his first grill, those highs and lows will smooth out. Mm -mm -mm, that's strike number two, Hank. Not owning up to the mistakes that you've made. Ooh, not a fan. At least when Peggy makes mistakes, she'll typically fix them herself, like when she got scammed by Vizosa and managed to get the money back, or when she took Lupe back to Mexico and was able to sweet-talk the judge into letting her go. But Hank can't ignore this problem forever, as Leon Kennedy has made the disturbing decision to give his drug dealer the phone number of Strickland Propane, meaning that he's using the business as a go-between for his illicit activities. Still though, that is nothing compared to this colossal and earth-shattering mistake. Strickland propane, taste the heat, not the meat. <gasps> Lord, no! And yes, it is certainly funny that the customer on the other end was so disgusted by this slip of the tongue that they decided to kill the whole relationship with Strickland right then and there, but I actually want to draw your attention to what George Bush's reaction here is. Taste the meat, not the heat. Taste the meat, not the heat. Meat, heat, meat, heat. He is smacking his head against the wall, trying to drive the correct slogan into the chewed up bubble gum that passes for his brain. I think this little glimpse of humanity does a lot to make the incredible melting man feel like an actual human being in pain rather than a single-minded doper who acts like an entitled and aggressive scumbag. He's less of a fallout psycho and more reminiscent of a dweller of Vault 106, except that's not a very memorable reference so I'll instead give a less accurate comparison and say he's like one of those crazy ass Garys in Vault 108. Gary! Gary! And much like the vault experiments of the Fallout series, Hank is unwilling to put a stop to this colossal fuck-up and instead chooses to throw a child into the mix because the presence of children has always made every disaster moment calmer and more predictable. You had me at fruit pies. Yes sir, Hank has decided to make Bobby supervise Robert Downey Jr., which should let you know just how dire the situation has become. And while Michael Jackson may initially be buzzing around Strickland propane like a white woman at Disneyland, things quickly go off the rails. Let's go, let's go, let's go! Oh god. There's more files here than there are stars in the universe. One can only imagine the sights this guy is seeing right now. The man is zoinked out of his mind and out of this universe. Woohoo! And since Bobby is part of the D.A.R.E. generation, he immediately recognizes what's going on and makes this rather glib report to the family. I have to do all the work because Dad's new employee is a drug addict. When you've heard as many former athletes lecture at your school as I have, you get to know all the signs. This is when we come to understand that this whole situation has sprung entirely out of Hank's negligence as Russell Brand very clearly listed the detox centers he's been to on his resume. Even if they are from the nonprofit sector, Six months at Helping Hands Institute, one year at Covenant Place. Those are detox centers. Centers? No, look, right here. Institute. Place. Whoa, 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 hold on, go back. What the fuck is this? Look at that! Hank just so happened to have Steven Tyler's information, his private employee file, right next to his goddamn dinner table where anybody can just pick it up and look at it. What the fuck is this? I guess, you know, I guess that shit doesn't have to live in a file cabinet at Strickland Propane. Not when there's a whole family of hills that you might need to justify yourself to. What the hell are you doing, Hank? My goodness! And yet, this revelation comes a little too late for Mr. Hill. Because while Mr. Strickland is guiding Mrs. Throckmorton into his business, whom you may remember as the lady who had her hand stuck to her walker in the snow job episode, poor John Belushi over there is practically catatonic. Ah. <laughs> what in the Sam Hill? Oh no! Jeez, Hank, he's a drooling nincompoop! <laughs> well, make sure you don't disgruntle him. We don't want him showing up tomorrow morning punching the clock with a 45. See, we may think that workplace shootings are more of a post-2000s kind of problem, but the fear of shootings has always been in the back of Americans' heads. 
I mean, hell, six of our 46 presidents have been shot, with an additional five being shot at, although two of those were directed at the White House itself, and neither Clinton or Obama were in the White House when that happened. Of course, I should also mention that the prize for the stupidest assassination attempt goes to, of course, Trumpleton, where somebody planned to kill the commander in Cheeto with a fucking forklift of all things, which is crazy and stupid and just clearly not forklift certified. So, you know, God, only in America, huh? <laughs> Anyway, Hank calls Robin Williams into the office and tries to give him the talk, which unfortunately fails because Hank is dancing around the issue and leaving the door open for personal interpretations. Yeah, a lot of things you can do with a good ratchet set. Maybe you can work on trucks. Hank, as your new chief mechanic, what I'd like to do first is fire Enrique. Am I the only one who got like a weird racially charged feeling behind that statement? Hmm. Also, this dude must be doing drugs faster than the eye can see because he looks perfectly fine in one shot and then totally fucked up in the next and then fine again like nothing happened. He is doing drugs so fast that he can get his fix while Hank is actually just staring straight at him. That's crazy. But once Hank sees that the message isn't clicking, he cuts to the chase and gives Sonic the Hedgehog the unfortunate news. As of five o'clock, you're fired. Oh no! And to Hank's credit here, he does give Matthew Perry the rest of the day off and even gives him the address of a detox clinic that can get him some help. This is where we run into Hank's third strike and the explanation for why I've been calling Mr. Leon all of these celebrity names. I chose to do that because Leon himself is a little bit too much of a flat character for us to get invested in or care about, and so connecting the struggles of well-known and well-liked people to this topic allows us to see his problems, his addictions, from a more nuanced view. Because I don't think addiction is something that we should condemn people for and just sign them off and say, well, you're an addict, that's it, you're hopeless, fuck you, goodbye. Because guess what? Joy and delight and pleasure and love and all that stuff can still come from those who are suffering. People will fall into self-destructive behaviors for a wide variety of reasons, even if they're rich, even if they're famous, even if they have every reason in the world not to do that kind of stuff, and it just sometimes will happen. And I don't consider someone to be a bad person if they happen to get into habits that hurt themselves. However, as we saw with the Leanne episode, addiction also causes suffering to those around you and hurts the people that care about you. So while I wouldn't say that you're a fundamentally bad person for having your own problems, having your own addictions and whatever, your issue shouldn't be put onto other people. And so no, I do not think that Hank was wrong for giving Leon the boot and saying like, look, you gotta get out of here, you're doing drugs on company property, on company time, so you gotta get the fuck out of here. Like that's all completely above board and I agree with that decision. However, what is wrong is how Leon does literally exactly what Hank tells him to do and is still regarded by the show and Hank as a giant pain in the ass. And that, my friends, is what really grinds my gears about this episode, because recovery is a delicate and important process, one that should be encouraged as much as possible. But the episode was so determined to frame Leon as a continuing problem, even when he's in recovery, that the show needed to bring in a familiar face from L.A. to stoke up our feeling of rage. Hello, Mr. Hill. Anthony Page, group leader, One Last Chance House. Are you aware that you hired a drug addict? I am now, that's why I fired him. Oh yeah, you're in trouble all right. That's right, there he is, roll out the red carpet everybody, Twig Boy is back, he's made his glorious return from the pilot, in fact there's even a deleted scene where Hank recognizes him. You're in trouble all right, it's against the law to fire this man, he's a drug addict. Twig Boy! But instead of giving us that glorious reunion, the show's editor decided to cut out that smile-inducing recognition and instead replace it with this alternate take, which is just... It's just sort of okay, I guess. He's a drug addict. Are you sure you don't want to shoot me? <clears throat> and yes, I know the recognition doesn't really bring anything meaningful to the episode, but cutting it out kind of gives us the impression that this is the first time Hank is meeting this dude, and that's kind of shitty for such an infamous and influential character. And unlike in the pilot episode, Mr. Boy is actually out here making a positive change in people's lives, saying that Leon can't be fired because he's in recovery, and the Americans with Disabilities Act has Leon's back. It ensures that no person, no matter how disadvantaged, how short, or obese, or blind, or gay, or even stoned, can be discriminated against. Yeah, well right now I'd kill for a big fat blind gay guy if we could just get some damn work done around here. So, I know it's only done for the sake of the joke, and I probably don't even need to say this, but the Americans with Disabilities Act does not consider being gay a disability. 
Maybe it would if you're so gay to the point where you can't do your job without getting sexed up, where you've entered into the territory of being a satiriasis or a nymphomaniac, but uh, <laughs> there I go talking about politicians again. He's got withdrawal therapy until 11. But then I take my methadone, so I should be feeling pretty good by the time I get here. I'm not gonna let you come to work late, all hopped up on Goofenthal. This may surprise you, but Hank is not entirely right about that. Methadone is actually a drug which helps curb the worst and most painful symptoms of opioid withdrawal, so while Leon might be quote-unquote hopped up, it is preferable to the intense suffering that he'd go through otherwise. The man would be a fucking train wreck. Need I remind us all of the first of Star Trek The Next Generation's truly great episodes, Symbiosis? I'm sure you remember that one. Remember, it's the one where an entire planet was held in what amounted to slavery because of their dependence on a drug that a different planet controlled completely. God, if Paramount wouldn't put me over such a copyright barrel and fuck me in my bony ass, I would review that shit right now. Star Trek is my addiction and I want it so bad. I want to talk about it, but they won't let me. <sighs> but whatever. In any case, the accommodations Leon needs are pretty basic. He's showing up to work later in the day because he's got, guess what, rehab. What a shocker. He's actually going to his meetings. And he needs the lights dims because his meds, the ones that cause him like to not really feel the pain of withdrawal and all that shit, are causing his eyes to dilate like crazy, and he'd rather not get eye damage if that's all right with you, Hank. And that's really all he needs. Just the lights dimmed a little bit and show up later to work because he's going to the thing that you told him to go to. That's it. Oh, but no, he does also get a futon at his office station because the medication he's taking has been known to cause lightheadedness and nausea, so that is the equivalent of a fainting couch that he gets just in case he fucking passes out. Neat. And honestly, real talk here, Leon kicking his habits is going to be much harder work than anything Strickland could throw at him, so let's give Leon the Employee of the Month sticker because really, this is going to be such a fucking nightmare for him. <laughs> this, of course, doesn't give Leon carte blanche to do nothing at all at work, but showing us the meetings where hypothetically Strickland comes in and meets with a legal team to determine what exactly what standards Leon should be held accountable to before he can be fired is just too dull for entertainment purposes. Okay! So instead of showing us all that shit, the show instead decides to go for a more, um, <laughs> let's generously call it, a straightforward approach. Put on your fancy clothes, hop a greyhound to Dallas, and buy every pill, pipe, powder you can find. See, you spread the stuff around like roach traps, and we'll get that boy hooked again. <laughs> yep, you heard it here, folks. They are so desperate to rid themselves of Leon that they are willing to get him hooked again and fuck up his whole recovery and screw him out of his whole life just so they can fire him. What the fuck? That's like the worst thing I've ever heard on this whole show. My God. But really, what caused this situation to feel so dire that they even had to entertain such an awful idea? Well, here's the thing. Because Leon's problems aren't actually that disruptive, the writers needed to make the rest of Team Strickland the worst fucking people imaginable, with each of them pretending to have a disability to get out of work, which somehow comes around to being Leon's fault. <laughs> like, what? Much too angry, honey. Sorry, Hank. I suffer from obsessive compulsive disorder. If I get out of this chair, Garth Brooks is gonna die. Ugh, too bloated. Huh, okay, actually those last two feel pretty authentic, so maybe it's just Joe Jack who's fucking the whole deal up here. Hmm. So, while we could dispel all this nonsense pretty easily by having Mr. Strickland call their bluff and tell him to go get a fucking doctor's note confirming their disability, why would we do that when we can instead go after Leon? Who cares that Joe Jack is the one who's truly using and abusing the system? That guy's hazmat certified and obviously hasn't forgotten how critical he is to the operation. The oh, honey, I'm too mad to drive a truck. It's almost like my anger is handicapping me. Joe Jack? So to keep the plot moving, Peggy stops by Hank's work and gets told about the state of affairs. She makes the rather profound point that quote-unquote anybody is disabled if you think hard enough, which kind of says something profound about the flawed human condition and how none of us are truly perfect in this world that demands perfection. But let's face it, none of us here in the audience are actually sober enough to absorb that profound point into our daily lives. Glug. So yes, Hank takes Peggy's advice and calls up Twig Boy saying that, hey, I've got a disability too. I've got a disability where, like, if I don't see people around me giving 110%, I'm sick to my stomach in this, like, really big and kind of showy speech about work ethics and how we've come to, like, oh, the, the country really sucks now and all that stuff. And when, like, Twig Boy and Leon don't really click with that idea, we then come to the strangest final straw of all time. Don't call me Leon anymore. That's the name I use drugs with. 
From now on, I want to be called, um, Hank Hill. No! No, that's too far. The episode really tries to paint this as like a weird and assholeish move by Leon, but let's really think about what he's doing for a second. Leon is effectively renouncing the identity that his drug users know him by and contact him by, and then decides to don the name of the man who helped him get clean. And quiz time, do you remember what Leon calls Hank throughout this episode? I'm gonna go throw up now, coach. I'm sorry I have to do this, coach. Okay, coach. In the world of sports terminology, coach is about the best bit of praise, the best nickname that you can give someone. By calling someone coach, you are essentially saying that they are your guiding light, your role model, the person who knows the strengths and weaknesses of a team and who cares about the combined successes of everyone involved. In essence, Hank is effectively Leon's inspiration for getting his life back on track and to stop using drugs. I'd actually say that this act of renaming himself, while perhaps a little unorthodox, actually says a lot about his commitment to staying on the straight and narrow path. Leon wouldn't fall back into using drugs because that's not what his hero, his archetype of goodness, Hank Hill, would do. But rather than take this as a sign of Leon's growth and say like, hey, this guy's actually fucking renaming himself after me in honor of me helping him get his life back on track, Hank is so disgusted by this move that he decides to pull a pro-gribble move and quit his job. What am I gonna do now? Whatever you want, Buck. With me gone, you're down to 14 employees. And that makes this your business, not the government's. Yeah, this is kind of a weird point and kind of this like strange get out of jail free card that the show pulls on us here. Uh, apparently Strickland only has 15 employees, even though the five branches of Strickland propane have already been well established by this point. So, eh? Good luck even running a McDonald's with only 15 people on the payroll, let alone a whole propane dealership with five different locations. Like, okay, I get it. I get this is the answer they came up with. They kind of backed themselves into a corner, whatever. This is sort of kind of fitting, but it's just, it isn't very funny. It doesn't really click with me in a way that I, I really enjoy. They're doing it to screw over Leon. Like, they're not firing the people with fake symptoms or anything like that. They're putting it all on this one guy. Like, he's the big core problem with the whole, like, like institution here it just really doesn't like work for me and i really don't like this answer on how they get out of the uh the problem here so whatever strickland boots the recovering mr leon and things apparently return to normal now strickland's just small enough to skirt the law y'all get back to work debbie you just lie right there and even though I'm really frustrated with this ending, it is nice that we get our very first look at Debbie here, even if that look is paired with a rather, um, uh, weird idea. Debbie's got the yuppie flu, and Hector claims he has something called priapism. He wants a roomier workstation and a view of Debbie. With Leon thrown out of his support net and presumably into unemployment, the real Hank Hill returns to Strickland and finds that, well, unfortunately, the real Buck is a little bit more vindictive than we might have thought. After a six-month probation period, you will be eligible for vacation and benefits. Oh, yeah, you gotta understand my position here. Last couple of Hank Hills I had... One of them was a drug the other quit on me. Yeah, that's right. He's putting Hank on probation, effectively punishing him for putting the business through all of that Leon trouble, which I have to say I think is a just punishment that Hank had coming. But that isn't quite the end of Hank's punishment, because as we saw earlier, Buck lacks the most basic of moral scruples and will dream up jigsaw level schemes to fuck with people. Which is what I believe causes the final set of events in this episode to happen. Because it is right when Hank is getting punished that Buck decides to introduce their new accessories associate to Hank, Maria Montalvo. I am so happy to be working with you, Hank. Yeah. This bit of workplace harassment is then immediately complicated by the extremely sudden and totally random appearance of Peggy, of all people. She looks disgruntled. This joke, while funny in the moment, kind of breaks my brain in fucking two big old pieces. What the hell? Throughout the whole episode, Peggy is giving Hank shit for not hiring the beautiful Maria, but now that Maria is hired, Peggy seems ready to kick her ass. And why is this exactly? Did she sense that Maria grabbed Hank's bony booty and just sort of like phase shifted over? Did she possibly hear about Maria's new position and now she's coming over in a jealous rage? That seems unlikely since even Hank didn't know that Maria was hired. What I think happened is that Strickland called Peggy and told her that Maria had grabbed Hank's butt. 
But now how could Buck have known that was going to happen? Well, because I think he put Maria up to it. That is a big old conspiracy theory, admittedly, but that's the only thing that makes sense to me and keeps things in character for everyone else. That's also why Maria is still later employed at Strickland and why Peggy didn't reduce her to a stain on the floor. Mr. Strickland orchestrated the whole thing as his revenge towards Hank. There are still a few issues with this theory, but that's really all I got. What do you think? Why is Peggy storming over to Strickland and what is just happening with this final gag? While we try to puzzle out that messy ending, the post credit scene shows that Strickland Propane is going to be doing drug testing on everybody, including Bobby, <laughs> and that the OCD guy doesn't seem to be faking his condition. You can go now. Hank, if you don't give me another cup, the Oak Ridge boys are gonna die. So let's wrap this baby up and break for lunch, shall we? Hank used unbiased and immoral hiring practices to screw people out of job positions. He didn't hire someone because of his sexual attraction to them. He neglected to do the most basic of background checks. He refused to admit his mistakes and pawned his problem off on his son. He acted only when Leon was catatonic. He treated the most basic of temporary accommodations as intolerable burdens. And he used an underhanded tactic to give Strickland the ability to fire a recovering addict. What the fuck? Is it any wonder that Hank is kept as an assistant manager? The man might know his propane, but he is a god-awful administrator, and that is me being very charitable to him. Well, Leon does do a lot of vomiting, even for a new employee. In discussing this episode online, I have seen some people argue that Leon was a lost cause and that he was going to inevitably fall back into his drug use, so Hank was totally justified in getting him fired, and to that I would say, remind me to never go swimming with you because you're the kind of person who would withhold a life preserver if you start to see someone drown. And whatever, it was clear he was gonna die anyway, so why waste a perfectly good life preserver? Forget pessimism, you're now serving nonsense. That's great. I'm gonna go throw up now, coach. So there, I now close my argument about Hank's abhorrent behavior. I'll let y'all discuss the rest of that in the comments. So now what do I actually think about the episode itself? Well, it's more than a little unusual. It frames Hank as shockingly incompetent and stuck in his ways, and then presents him with a situation which he's not prepared to deal with in any way, which, you know, is always funny, but then it kind of runs out of steam on the whole Leon plot and had to turn the entire business into assholes to keep the conflict going, and even bring in Twig Boy because they just had no other way of giving this thing any teeth. So, whatever, man, I don't know. The solution to the Leon problem is really strange and I don't like it and the Maria ass grab is totally out of left field and I still don't understand what the fuck Peggy's even doing there, but this is also a very quotable episode and it has two really big scoops of trademark King of the Hill humor. Remember Hank, he's wearing the name Strickland over his man teat. I'll also give the episode a lot of praise for giving Hank such a negative characterization and not handling him with the kid gloves. A little contempt for your main character goes a long way, and there's nothing more boring than an infallible goody two-shoes who can do nothing wrong. So even though I've practically turned myself inside out complaining about Hank's behavior, I wouldn't actually want any of it to change. Such big flaws are also why Peggy is my favorite character on the show, not in spite of her flaws, but because of them. If anything, I wish the writers had believed in Hank's ability to survive negative portrayals more often, because as I'm sure you all know, even these awful actions will have their share of defenders, people who will claim without a hint of media literacy that Hank did nothing wrong, even though we definitely see here that he did so, so many things wrong, and you know what? That is okay. And for me, this is indeed the time that Hank was worse than Peggy, which in my eyes is quite the compliment. You're what Too Tall Jones called a codependent enabler. But if this topic wasn't to your liking, then don't worry, I think the next review will be much better. Because while Hank also has some iffy moments there, it is a much grayer area, and I don't blame him for handling it poorly, as he was faced with an opponent that presents a rather unique topic of discussion. Mr. Witchard? Oh! Huh? But that's for next time. Until then, we can say that this episode, titled Junkie Business, has indeed been reviewed to death. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next review. You hired a drug addict instead of that beautiful Chicana. My God, Hank, how badly did you want that woman? Oh, 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 yeah.